Hi, we're on board uh, the Oyster 62 G5, uh, a hero of Lymington, and I'm here with uh, Steve Powell, who's her owner, and uh, had her built, and uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, how he came to um, have her built and all of the adventures that she's had. So, Steve, what was your sailing experience before you bought a hero? Uh, famously, actually quite limited. Um, right. I had uh, uh, enjoyed sailing on a number of occasions and barefooted with sunset, bizarrely. And, and it, it was a big family thing, but it was only um, in the late, early 2000s that I suddenly discovered this and I started racing small boats to figure out how this sailing thing thing worked yeah, yeah. and I raced um, small RS elites for a number of years and then started taking my RYA tests coastal skipper etc day skipper coastal stripper and then um, yacht master so what made you choose Oyster 62 G5 oh I think um, th there was a number of things obviously having seen oysters in marinas all over the place when, when traveling. I traveled a lot in my career. I also photographed sailing quite a bit. And I'd seen oysters everywhere, and they are obviously beautiful boats and very notable. Um, but I think the overriding uh, reason when I checked, you know, looked at all the different boats is that at the end of the day, uh, if it all went horribly wrong, I couldn't blame oyster, they were too good. It was gonna be down to me. Uh, you never regret buying the best, and it was the best, and still is the best of breed. And it's exactly what I was looking for in terms of a blue water cruiser, long distance, comfort, comfort and everything that goes with it. Because you didn't have a hero built just to do the kind of North Atlantic circuit. No. You were thinking high latitude, you were thinking tropics. Um, there was a lot more to it when you actually put her into build. When I first started building Uhuru, my first meeting with the project manager in, uh, at Oyster, Mike Taylor, I arrived with a single sheet of paper which uh, handed over and it basically said the name of the boat is Uhuru and explained to him why. It means freedom in Swahili. I was brought up in uh, East Africa in the 50s and it was a big uh, troubled time at the, in East Africa at the time in Kenya and uh, Uhuru was a very famous cry. Mm -hmm. Of freedom and it stuck with me all my life so when I first met Mike Taylor I said simple things but you know one she must be able to survive and sail well in Caribbean and Antarctic summer conditions she must be able to uh, be sailed comfortably short-handed uh, she must have good water and fuel capabilities for long long passages and finally um, my keys requirements were quality engineering, uh, reliability, redundancy, and safety. And, and I guess that made quite a big difference, the specification and the time of build and all of that. It, it took longer than to build than a regular 62, mainly because of a lot of discussion about, you know, how we weren't trying to build an icebreaker. I didn't want an icebreaker. I wanted the, her to... You wanted a yacht. I wanted a beautiful yacht um, and I took all the right advice at the time as to what was necessary in order to go to Antarctica, sail in high latitudes safely and successfully. And without, I think you worked with Richard Howarth, didn't you? I worked, yeah. yeah, Richard was fantastic support and he attended many of the meetings and many of the discussions about it. And every time we got to a critical point, you know, Richard was always involved and asked him about it. It was... You know, it was more about every time we, we on in terms of um, main systems, you know, the boat has duplicates on pretty much every main system. And that was important for us going forward. And um, But also little things when it came to through the hull fittings, it came to all the, the, the piping and, and the, the various uh, different consum consumables on the boat. Whenever there was a choice between this price point or that price point and, and a quality difference, uh, you'll find that we went for the better one because of where we were planning to go. Mm -hmm. okay. 
Okay. So now you have your hero and you've had the launch party. What happened next? Where did you go? I know this is a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we actually came back here to the Solent for uh, a couple of months, a lot of sleep trials and preparations, training, uh, friends and family. Um, uh, it was quite a different boat to anything we'd have ever sailed on before. A bit bigger uh, than the Elite. A little bit bigger than the Elite, yes. And uh, so spent a lot of time with friends and family who were going to be my primary support in, in this journey. Um, you know, taking them out week-long trips around the Solent and down the south coast and around and we had uh, good help and support on that with training and then we headed off um, towards Palma, went across the channel and to uh, Camaret de Sur which was our first stop uh, on, foreign shores, on yeah. foreign shores <laughs> uh, and then across the Biscay and I had my daughters on board, my eldest daughter on board June crossing the Biscay for the first time. But that was actually uh, the first time I'd ever crossed an ocean in a boat. <laughs> so it was quite an experience and um, uh, it, it set the tone. We had a very good crossing, uh, lost a spinnaker, but other than that, it went safely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so then you did the hot places, so Caribbean, east coast of the States... Um, we've got all these wonderful books um, that uh, are based on your blogs with amazing imagery um, with all the places you've been. So you did hot water and then what about the cold, chilly stuff? I say, well, we left and did the Ark in 2008, season in the Caribbean, then uh, went up the East Coast and uh, left uh, in Newport, Rhode Island for the hurricane season. Mm -hmm and then came early into Newport on around September, October time on 2010 and started going south and um, 2009, sorry, and started going south, did the whole East Coast, which was a fantastic experience, really enjoyed that sailing, back for another Caribbean season. And so it gave us two good seasons to actually get to know the boat, to understand the boat and have some fun family time as well as anything else. Um, I then left uh, her in um, Prickly Bay in Grenada right. for that hurricane season. She was all strapped down in hurricane cradle um, and went home for a couple of months and came back in September, which again was very early to start preparation. Um, for that point, we were heading down to the Falkland Islands. Um, what we, was the preparation like? I mean, it was. Well, I mean, it's, it's not like doing Caribbean yeah, season, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it caused great amusement as we were testing out some thermal survival suits in the in the Caribbean in, in September, <laughs> which is so hot and humid, it's not true. And you know, I was getting uh, you know uh, guys in the yard there building ice picks, and and they had no idea what we were doing. But um, what's an ice pick? You know. 12 foot long picks. Uh, there was lots of fun things like that where, you know, it was quite amusing and trying to find all the equipment we needed. Most of it we had already pre-prepared, so we knew we had, but then there's always the last minute bits and pieces. Um, Caribbean was quite an interesting place to try and find it all. We ended up sourcing as we went down south, uh, sourcing everything we needed going down th through South America. But um, we left um, Grenada quite um, quickly um, as Hurricane Otto was coming in and the island was going down into lockdown and I thought, well, if it really does get hit, we're not going to be safe here, we'd be better out at sea. Um, so we actually ended up, um, as anybody I'm sure watching this knows, that prevailing winds there are easterlies and we had a window of about 24 hours where the hurricane actually killed all the wind around Grenada because of the way it, it uh, rotates the winds. And we managed to motor successfully, flat out, eastwards, and then get out of the way of the hurricane and head south. So that gave us a good slingshot opportunity to start heading down South America. And then, um, and, and then further down, and then tell me about the Falklands because... Oh, the Falklands was fantastic. We, were, we arrived there just before Christmas uh, 2010 
and uh, we'd had a, an eventful trip down the Americas, uh, calling in all the main spots. Family had flown in and out and joined us. And then at the last bit from uh, Punta, uh, Punta del Est, um, we had a pretty experienced crew on board and sailed down to the Falkland Islands. We then had uh, about two, three weeks preparation in the Falklands. Uh, other crew flew in and joined us there. Is there anything there? I mean, is it? Oh, it's beautiful. Absolutely really? stunning. People are the friendliest and nicest people you could ever want. So helpful. We started off reefed, being reefed up uh, with uh, one of the Pelagic Skip Novak's uh, team and in the commercial um, dock there, in the commercial port, because uh, there was nowhere else, basically. And um, everyone managed to find us water in that and power and then we started doing the preparations and as soon as we talked to people about you know engineering problems we might have everyone was helpful okay. so uh, and, and then it was Antarctica is, is, is that the standout moment for you the standout part of this huge adventure um, yes I suppose it, it is um, because the imagery uh, is amazing. The imagery is amazing, and, and we ended up sp managed to spend uh, uh, just about two weeks in Antarctica, which was pretty much the limit. It's a long time, actually. It is, yeah. yeah. We were very lucky with the weather, um, or I chose a good window, that's debatable. <laughs> but we were very lucky with the weather, and we got out just ahead of a major storm, so we had a good window and opportunity there. And, um, and did you feel safe in the boat? Oh, that I never felt anything other than safe in the boat. Um, there's no question. It was, uh, she's a very sound boat. Now, obviously she's not built for ice conditions and, and she's not built for Antarctica per se. Um, but um, in those summer conditions in Antarctica and taking the necessary precautions of where you anchor, how you anchor, what the wind conditions are, etc., etc., many... Uh, quite a few fiberglass hull boat, boats go down there quite successfully. Yeah, but I think it is about preparation, isn't yeah. it? It's about having the right yeah. boat and actually it's about good seamanship and not taking a risk. Things yeah. that you can do in the Caribbean, you just you, can't You do don't that. do that, no. Yeah. No, it's a very, very different type of sailing, uh, very defensive sailing. And uh, as I said, we had a pretty good window, op uh, weather window but near the, near the end of it, we were planning to spend another two or three days and, and do one of the uh, Antarctic bases down there that we wanted to visit. But conditions were starting to try, change. Uh, one night, we, well, I say night, we didn't really have nights, but one 12-hour uh, period that was supposed to be night, I think we were up four times changing anchor positions because of changing wind conditions. Because our biggest risk, of course, was pack ice coming in with the wind and trapping us inside a small bay. So we had to be aware of that at all times and take us out. And then we headed off and sailed back around the Horn into Ushuaia. And we then spent two- What was two the Horn like? The Horn was fantastic. I mean, um, I we, mean we, is... we had uh, uh, pretty benign conditions. Uh, I say benign, we had 30 plus knots of wind uh, northeasterly, so yeah, it was pretty good. Um, and we went round the horn, um, and then afterwards, as we got round the back of the horn, it was beautiful, absolutely stunning. Uh, and then managed to get into a safe harbour, um, dropped a hook, and about seven hours, eight hours later, I think it was, a full force eight nine hit the horn. Wow. And it, uh, two days later, we were in a shire, and one of one of uh, Skip Novak's boats came in just behind us. They were 24 hours behind us and had a very unpleasant journey so across the straits so we were quite lucky there. Okay. Again that was about being cautious. I I didn't have the experience that Skip Novak's skippers had so uh, I got out good. when it was uh, still safe. Mm. Yeah. And then back and then more Mediterranean cruising. Well we spent uh, two and a half months in Patagonia, three months in Patagonia which if I was honest, is probably the highlight of the whole trip. Oh, that's the standout moment. <laughs> yeah, that, yes, Patagonia was fantastic, especially as, you know, um, my wife joined me there and other family joined us and friends. Uh, whereas for Antarctica, we had a pretty um, well-experienced crew, 
Um, not family, it was friends, but good, experienced people. Um, when we, Patagonia, it was my wife and other friends and stuff, and we had a ball. Uh, it was more challenging, sailing-wise, than Antarctica, because of the winds, and certainly uh, um, the scary moments came from Pat Patagonia. <laughs> But it was beautiful, absolutely stunning. We'd go, you know, uh, two or three weeks without seeing anybody at all. Yeah. And, and and so, all the time that you've spent with Uhuru, um, you know, she's a big boat. She needs a lot of maintenance and looking after. H how did you manage that? Because you didn't go with crew, and y mm. I mean, you were the captain, and and you've always been the captain. Yeah, um, I had um, for a period. I had some uh, what uh, first mate basically. <laughs> Uh, for Antarctica, it was a young guy called Chris Durham, uh, but I had two others pr prior to him, and they were, you know, my priority was people I could get on with. They were young guys who were keen to, to learn and, and um, have adventures and stuff, um, and it, that was very useful and very helpful. And a, I learned a great deal as well, but I always maintained the boat. I always did the, the headed up the maintenance and all the rest of it. I also had a friend um, who was also a pretty good engineer, so when he was on board and he spent a lot of time on board, we, between us, one way or another, managed the maintenance. But for the last three years, my wife and I have been in the Mediterranean, just the two of us. And, you know, we've managed all the maintenance and look after her. Uh, it's, it's what you get used to, and it's discipline, and it's going through the paces and knowing that once a week you can spend X amount of time. And also uh, knowing that it's about things that will always go wrong, so don't get upset when they do. Yeah. And, and, and I think also, I mean, looking at the records of Uhuru, she's always been well maintained. She's always gone into shipyards, she's had stuff yeah. replaced before it's broken, there's all that sort of stuff going on. And I think that's quite important in the life of a boat. I think that's also a, a, a function of my inexperience from the early days, and that in, in the sense that I was always very conscious um, at that. I wanted to maintain the boat, keep the boat going. And that's why I made sure every time we went in, we used to, in the, in the Mediterranean, we used to, um, we kept the boat in Malta over the winter. And for a few weeks in the summer, we'd also keep the boat in Malta where we came back here. Every time she went in, I made sure that engines were done and I got professionals in to do it. And uh, so she's always had an agent somewhere looking after her, making sure that you know, all the necessary work's being done. Um, the worst moment and the best moments really actually come in one. The worst moment was um, suddenly realising that we were in a middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, in a force 10 11 in the Southern Oceans that hadn't been forecast and hadn't, hadn't been predicted. Um, we were trying to get north up to Uruguay and after leaving in the end of the season. And um, we were beam on to a growing, growing sea, which was quite scary. And I had pretty inexperienced crew with me at the time. The best moment was three days later <laughs> <laughs> when the sun came out. We're running with the seas. We're not far from the Falkland Islands. We've been blown off to the Falklands. Uh, and for three days and three nights, we'd um, helmed two of us, one, one hour on, one hour off. Jeez. Um, we'd hove two to get some sleep in 60-foot seas. And after three days, the sun came out, the wind was still blowing, but we were surrounded by the most beautiful pierced dolphins, which are absolutely gorgeous. And they escorted us into Port Stanley. Uh, that was the highlight of anyone's sailing career. It was the most amazing experience. Uh, so the combination of the worst and the best all happened within a few days. And so now, you and Uhuru, you've been far, you've done much, the family have done much. What happens next? Uhuru's adventure was always that. We've actually, my wife and I have lived on this boat for the majority of our ownership of this boat. You know, coming back to the UK for a few months. I wouldn't say we were live aboard, but we spend a lot more, spent a lot more time actually sailing and actually um, living on this boat than most oysters would owners would experience. So for us, we've crammed, you know, a lot into essentially eight years. 
uh, seven, eight years. Um, keeping this boat here in the Solent, she wants to be out on the big waters. She needs somebody else yeah. to have the next yeah. adventure. She needs somebody to take her on, take her on to the big adventures and, and, and put miles underneath her. Uh, we've, as a family, um, decided that we've had an, we've done enough of the big long distance. We'll carry on sailing around the Solent. I'll carry on racing and enjoying it. Um, but uh, yeah, we put in a few years. So we've, I guess, we've, we've so I guess the books are completed. <laughs> I think that the books are completed. Yes.